Good afternoon, uh, Just uh, Thank you so much for granting us this interview. Can you state your name and your profession? My name is Kathy Han Huang. My uh, Vietnamese name is Bao Khanh. So, uh, in order for the American to say my my first name easily, I use Kathy for Khanh. I am the uh, full-time presiding judge of Court 14, Houston Municipal Court. Thank you. How long have you been appointed this position and how was the process? I have been um, the presiding judge for Court 14 um, for almost 15 years now. I was appointed by uh, Mayor Lee P. Brown in 1998 and so uh, it's been a long time. Uh, how was the process um, to become a presiding judge? Well, at first you would have to, um, to be a licensed uh, attorney with the state of Texas and my positions, I did not run for this position but I was appointed by uh, the mayor. Mayor Brown appointed me originally um, 15 years ago. And so he, the mayor has the ability to select from a list of uh, very qualified um, attorneys to select the, the judge for the city. So uh, besides being the licensed attorney, um, the the judge would have to have moral uh, characters, uh, the um, integrity, also have the um, respect from the um, from the professional and community respect. Um, also, the uh, judge would have to be competent and be able to do the job, because the mayor has the um, um, the choice of either reappointing the judge after two years. Uh, or the mayor can decide if the judge is not doing the good job and not reappoint the judge. In my case, I have been appointed um, three times by uh, Mayor Lee Brown, and then I will be reappointed by Mayor White for another six years. So uh, Mayor Anise Parker uh, or, um, appointed me again. So it has been 15 years going through three mayors. Wow. So every two years you have to get reappointed? Every two years the mayor will review your, um, your work, your, um, your ability, and decide whether that um, he or she uh, should uh, be continued with the job. Um. Can you uh, describe your your duty? Well, as um, well, of course, I'm the presiding judge um, for um, the courtroom court 14 with the uh, municipal Houston Municipal Court. So my main function is to hear cases, but actually, um, the judges with the city of Houston have two function: uh, being a judge and also. Uh, the magistrate for the state of Texas and for as a judge you hear cases and different type of cases in the courtroom and as a magistrate for the state of Texas the judge uh, gives statutory warning to the arrested people uh, the judge um, issue arrest and such warrant allowing the officers to come into the uh, house the business to arrest the people or search the premises. And also the, um, the judge or the magistrate can also issue um, protective, emergency protective uh, order for um, the cases involving um, the people in the same family we call family violence. So in those situations, the victim can ask the judge and the judge will, uh, as a magistrate, can issue uh, protective uh, emergency protective order. I see. So you more really like uh, the um, 
the judge for or for the uh, to um, address the law of Texas rather than a civil court. Mm, uh, how is that? As a magistrate, the uh, arrested people, uh, the officers will bring the people to in front of the judge to see if um, they have probable cause and also um, the magistrate or the judge give warnings to the people uh, basically informing them of their rights. I should ask that is it like a criminal violation rather than a civil court law you do? Well yes it's a criminal court because only the people committed some criminal uh, be uh, arrested and put in jail. In our courts here, um, it's fines only, but it, that means that the people can pay the, pay the fines, but uh, if they do not pay the fines, or if they do not appear in court on their court date, they um, may be arrested later on and put in jail. Uh, just um, being a uh Double minority as a woman and an Asian American, uh, do you feel any advantage or disadvantage in your profession? Well, um, I'm an Asian, so the uh, minority. It's uh, I'm also a woman, so like you said, it's double minority. Um, well, I'm also as fat as size. I'm consider petite or small, so. Fifteen years ago, when I became the uh, the presiding judge for the court, and to my understand, um, I was the first uh, Vietnamese woman uh, appointed a position, a full-time presiding judge for a courtroom, not in, in the United States. So it was um, uh, at first I encounter some difficulty. Um, just because um, they, the people um, didn't know me and wanted to kind of wait and see if uh, this judge, Asian judge, uh, woman, can do a, a good job. So I have encountered some challenges, but uh, I, I think I overcome all those challenges. Um, and. That's the reasons I am here after 15 years. Wonderful. So what is the, the, okay, the significant contribution you think that you contribute into this ecosystem? The, um, as far as uh, um, the court system here, I think from the time that uh, I became the judge, I think the court system learned more about the Asian culture, particularly the uh, Vietnamese American culture, um, to understand our community more. Um, and for our community, I have involved um, in a lot of uh, volunteer works. Um, I uh, have a radio talk show, and I appear in on TV show to inform our community of uh, the law, the most updated information. Uh, every time the law, do we have new laws or changes in law? Because I believe that um, um, knowledge is crucial. We cannot uh, ab abide by the law if we don't understand what we have to do. So the first thing is I would like our community to know more about the law in order to be in compliance. And uh, I also inform our, the people in our community of uh, our legal rights uh, in order to um, solve or resolve the cases, the matters um, in a better way. Uh, by the law, what the law allows us to do. Just uh, being uh, a full-time and senior judge, what is it the most challenge to you up until today, you feel? Well, I think um, I have um, met with a lot of 
people in my courtrooms. Every day I, um, I see like hundreds of people. They, they are defendants, uh, attorneys, witnesses, um, uh, the uh, staff, the co-workers, uh, police officers, inspectors. So a lot of people come to our court on a daily basis. Um, well, for me, I think that I can deal with uh, all of them. Uh, I treat everybody fair and equally. Um, the most, I think, the most um, thing that I think is difficult is to deal with uh, uh, some people who are um, unreasonable. And sometimes the people who have uh, very strong prejudice against certain people, certain group of people. So uh, those people, that's, uh, I think that I, it's a little bit challenge for me. Yeah. Yes, uh, I asked this question and I hope that you can answer me. Uh, uh, who is just the uh, Kati Han Huang? Uh, well, I, as you know, my background, I, I was a refugee. Um, I travel here by boat. Um, so I have gone through a lot of challenge in my life. Being a refugee and being an older student in law school, uh, have to overcome a lot. English is not my first language. English is my second language. Uh, I was uh, um, older. I, when I came here, I was no longer um, young age that I could attend like high school. So um, I have to overcome a lot of challenges. That give me a lot of understanding for uh, um, the people coming to my court. Um, I think that make me uh, a more patient, more patient judge. Um, I have uh, more compassion to what the people coming to court. Um, and I treat as a minority myself, I, I treat all groups of people, all people coming to my court in the same way. So um, I remember during my inauguration, um, Mayor Lee Brown, the original mayor who appointed me, um, said a few words and I think his definition uh, and the reasons why he appointed me uh, was uh, correct in his observation. So he was saying that um, um, Mayor uh, Brown said that, um, he said that then this is code. I am very delighted to appoint a very capable person, someone who has proven herself to be a role model for the others to follow. And upon arriving from a war-torn Vietnam, Judge Kathy Han bravely faced overwhelming challenges to help her family and re-establishing re herself in the United States. And she's a leading advocate for the well-being of the Vietnamese community. And she has fought hard to promote and enhance understanding between the Vietnamese American and other communities. And he also said uh, that uh, her personal struggles have given her a keen sense of understanding of the needs for our society. That understanding will guide her safeguarding the integrity of justice, safeguarding the integrity of the law. So I think he was right in saying that because I have to overcome a lot of struggles, a lot of difficulties in my life. Um, I have um, kind of, he's in his word, a keen sense of understanding for the needs of our society. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge, you said you came from Vietnam. Can you share with us some experience during the war, how you like, like during that time? 
and then um, how the war affected you and your family. My uh, my parents um, were refugees themselves. They came um, to the south of Vietnam from the north in 1954, and I was a very young. Um, I was in 1954. They brought me to the south with them. Uh, they had. I have six other siblings, uh, so I came from a very uh, crowded family, and my parents uh, had hard time reestablishing themselves in the south. Uh, so my ch childhood was not easy. Uh, I had to help my parents a lot, uh, and. I worked a lot to even when I was at a much young age. Um, we live in a very small house. Um, well, you consider not wealthy, if not poor family, refugee family. But um, thanks to my parents, they always stressed on education. So, um, they always saved money to um, send us to classes, uh, so to make sure that we had good education. Um, so I graduated from college in Vietnam uh, before I became a refugee in the United States. Um, and so during the time I grew up, um, I had to faced with a lot of um, situation, many uprisings, because uh, our house was very near the, the only radio broad, broadcasting station in Vietnam. So every time there were some uprisings, they, uh, there were rockets and bombs uh, to, with the effort, with their effort to silence the only stations. Uh, so we always have to deal with those uh, situations. So my father, he, um, he dug a, uh, a big hole in the middle of the kitchen uh, so for us to come to the, to, for hiding every time there were some uprisings and rockets and bombs. Um, so the, we, if you're asking me if I was affected by the war, yes, I was. Thank you. You come to U.S. and how would the journey to freedom? Well, I came to the United States in 1975. Um, our journey was very challenging because um, we uh, we went by boat um, when. The early months of 1975, when my parents um, uh, learned of the communists took over different cities in Vietnam, in Vietnam, uh, they were terrified. They uh, said that uh, with their experience living in the north and had to migrate to the south, um, when the communists uh, took over. Vietnam, the people from the north who had escaped the communists one time, they were fearful and they told us that the communists would not um, leave them uh, without giving them a lot of difficulty if they, if not persecution, if they um, come to Saigon. So by all means, we uh, had tried to escape Vietnam. Uh, in the night of uh, April 29, 1975, our family, including uh, my late husband and my two small children, one was uh, a premature baby, a month old. Um, one was 18 months old. Um, we had to find a way to fl 
actually escaped Vietnam. And during the day, we, uh, we heard that there were some boats at the dock leaving Vietnam. So we um, took some mainly uh, baby formulas for um, my premature baby. And then uh, for the toddler, the 18 months toddler, we um, we went to the docks. Then, with the hope that we can find a, a boat. And after searching in the middle of the night, um, in the middle of um, chaos, rockets, bombs, uh, looting people running around on in the street uh, we finally got on board of a boat um, leaving Vietnam uh, we just got on the boat without knowing where we would go um, the main thing was we were running away from Vietnam fear fearful that we would be persecuted um, if the communists took over so we left Vietnam and in the, just a few hours before the uh, communists came into Saigon at the early morning of uh, April 30, uh, 1975. So our journey was a very difficult time for us. We, um, we were on the boat with the babies without any um, clean water for uh, the, um, for our baby, for my baby. And unfortunately, because uh, there was not much food for us to eat, so I did not produce enough milk uh, for the baby. Um, the baby uh, had to, I had to use um, very unclean water and mix the powder, the, the baby formula. Um, but thanks God, um, he survived the journey of several weeks on the boat. Um, at one time, our boat was no longer operable. Um, and we were uh, rescued by the American 7th Fleet um, in the open sea. And we travel um, on the boat, uh, on the, we were transferred to the Seventh Fleet, and then we um, arrived at different camps at Guam and different uh, camps in the United States, in Arkansas. Um, finally, we uh, settled in Chicago, Illinois, after several months um, traveling on the boat and living at different refugee camps. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite a journey for us, just because if we have two babies. Well, um, you came such a difficult time to come to U.S. So your, how your life like after that? How you start your life and your family again in this um, uh, brand new, uh, new country? Well, when we, we were sponsored to Chicago, Illinois, um, well, my first feeling when we uh, were sponsored there was a sense of uh, gratitude. Um, gratitude to the American people to give us a home. Um, we, we were refugees. We had no home, no country at that time. And we were given a home. So it's a sense of gratitude. Um, I, I thank God very much for uh, safeguarding my family through such a long, long journey with, uh, with, the, the, with the two babies. Um, they survive. And, and I think back in our boat, with people travel with us, there were 
people that didn't make it and they had to um, um, had some funeral um, for those people uh, when they put the bodies in the, in the sea. So I very, very, very much thank God for uh, safeguarding our families through such a, a journey here. Um, so that's first, it's a sense of blessing and gratitude. But we, we were very worried because we have to find a way to survive in this new country. Um, we have to find some marketable skills in order to be able to find jobs. Um, so the first step was we, um, we just tried to get any kind of work in order to support our family. So my late husband found a job uh, in the factory as a punch press operator. And I found some job, I worked some part-time job cleaning houses. Um, if I'm not taking care of my babies or if I'm not trying to go to school to learn a, a marketable skills. So um, besides working, I attended uh, community college first to learn English, more English, um, to learn typing and some office skills to in order to be able to find job. Uh, so the next year in 1970, in 1976, I um, had some typing, sufficient typing speed. So. Um, I went out looking for jobs in 1976. My first job in the United States was with the uh, governor's office in Chicago. Um, at first I worked as a typist and then uh, I became an um, um, administrative assistant and then I uh, got a job as employment coordinator. Um, later on, I worked for Truman College in Chicago as an uh, employment coordinator. Um, so those are the, uh, my first job uh, in the United States. What, what, what um, um, difficulty you, you've been to and then how you balance between family, work, school? Uh, your children were pretty young and need a lot of attention from you. Yes. Uh, well, I think that's uh, it's hard. It's not only difficult for me, but I think this is the um, the challenge for uh, for Vietnamese women, uh, older women. When we came to the U United States, when we were no longer young, we have a family to take care. We have the children um, to take care, and we want them to do well in this new country. So. Um, you have to balance um, your family, your um, career, and you have to make enough money for, um, for your children to survive and you have to support your family. So it's a very much a challenge for me. Um, so I decided that when my children were young, I was just taking classes here and there, mainly for for my jobs. Um, so I didn't involve, get into um, a full-time uh, studying, just part-time studying uh, to pay more attention to my children when they were young. And when they were in high school, they were um, a little bit bigger and they did not need my attention as much as when they were young. And then at that time I began to think about um, trying to fulfill my dream of uh, being a lawyer. Uh, seems like you said that uh, you came back to university to study full time when your children got older. They in the age of high school. So um, 
Well, she and your children were uh, in school, uh, university at the same time. Do you? How do you feel about that? Well, uh, I was in law school, and one of my uh, of my sons, uh, he was at Rice University, and at one time, my younger um, son, the one who was a baby, a month old baby. He was at the University of Texas, so in one year, um, the three of us was in college. Uh, it was a very much a challenge for us to pay tuition uh, for the three of us in college. Um, it's very difficult, uh, but we manage it. I I was working. I was working when. Uh, I was in law school, so when I was in law school, I um, I could not afford to quit working uh, and just concentrating on my studying. I can only afford to be a part-time student at the law at law school at South Texas College of Law on a part-time basis, um, while supporting my family um, and my two my younger two sons, but. Um, my my late husband, he helped a lot with um, um, helping with me with the housework, uh, paying more attention to um, my children, to our children, so um, I can I could concentrate a little bit more on my uh, studying and working at the same time. And it's not easy; it's very tough. Uh, for me, for especially during the first semester uh, in law school. Um, what kind of book when you were going to law school uh, that you had? I at that time I was working uh, with uh, a law office. Um, when I moved from Chicago to Houston um, to fulfill a dream to be uh, uh, an, a business owner. So when I moved to Houston, I um, established um, some businesses, a washing area and dry cleaning business. And I also um, established a translation interpretation service, providing different language interpreters for courts, um, hospital, lawyer office. Um, so when I was in in law school. I'm still working at the law office and still running my uh, my business, translation business. Um, it was it was very tough. Uh, just so from that job you learn Spanish. I was in your courtroom and I it was very impressive when I see you uh, um, I mean uh, uh, doing the just job with three languages English, Vietnamese and Spanish. Well, no, actually, I did not learn Spanish when uh, when I uh, was the owner of the translation uh, and interpretation service. I had uh, other uh, Spanish interpreters who helped me translate if I have a job assignment for uh, for Spanish. Um, I learned Spanish when I became a judge here in the court in the court here. Um, I see the need to help um, another group. Of uh, people, the Spanish-speaking people who come into the court, I uh, we have Spanish interpreters here, um, but I do not want them to have to wait a long time in the courtroom, because usually we have a heavy docket. So if I can uh, speak Spanish, uh, I can move the dockets, I can work quicker to help the people more efficiently. So. I started learning Spanish just um, by working in the courtroom, and I see the need to help more people. Um, to so I speak uh, the Spanish. I speak Spanish, um, and then also with um, uh, the Vietnamese people coming to the courtroom, I speak Sp Vietnamese to them if they do not speak English well. But I can only speak in either Spanish or Vietnamese to explain to them about the court procedures during the trial. Uh, I would use either um, a Spanish interpreter or a Vietnamese interpreter 
because we we don't do not speak any English or you do not speak any Spanish or Vietnamese during the trial. We use we go through the um, the certified interpreter in the courtroom. Yeah. Uh, just, um, how do you keep in uh, contact with the Vietnamese American community? I um, I feel I'm I feel that I'm very blessed to be here, and I feel that um, um, I'm indebted to um, this country, this society, um, and I feel that I would like to help um, the people who came here as, as refugees like myself become our immigrants. Uh, so I have always tried to um, help the community in any way I can. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have a um, talk show um, to inform our community of different um, informations legal um, information. Um, I also involve, I also go to different schools to talk to the children um, about how they can um, be better. Um, I, it's more motivations. I explain to them that um, if they try hard, um, they will be there will be a lot of opportunities for them in this country. If you are willing to work hard and um, if you you are not afraid of working, then you will definitely succeed. So I go to different schools. Um, well, in the early 90s, um, we together with uh, a group of friends, many other friends, we organize um, the uh, American youth organizations helping the young people to um, go to different colleges. If um, um, they have questions about um, different colleges, we, uh, we organize seminars or meetings to help them. We also organize um, cultural uh, events to raise funds for um, um, Asian students. And right now we still have, we established some scholarships for um, Asian students at Rice University. We also have uh, some colleges for uh, law students at uh, South Texas and also at Texas Southern. Um, we uh, we help at one time in the early 1990. If you remember, there was um, both people stranded in uh, in Hong Kong in different refugee camps, especially um, orphanage. Um, the people who went without or young people who went without parents. So we organize cultural events. Um, to raise funds for them, uh, and also to introduce our culture to the general population, the American uh, population. So I will always involve with uh, with our culture, with our community in one way or, or the other. Well, I have been uh, a judge in this courtroom for. Um, a number of years and a few years ago there was uh, an opportunity um, to be a federal administrative judge. Um, I applied for that position. I went through a number of uh, um, test examinations. Uh, I went to Washington DC twice or three times. I passed all the tests. Um, they there were written tests, uh, oral tests, interviews in Washington, D.C. And my name um, has been on the list for uh, appointment to a federal uh, administrative judgeship. 
um, to different location in the United States. Uh, well, but when I um, when I apply, I only want to apply if there is a position in uh, in Houston, Texas, because um, my family um, is here, and I have my mother who is already almost ninety years old. So uh, I do not want want to leave her going to another state and not here for her. Uh, so, um, well, there was not, there was another, not the, another position um, in Houston. Uh, it's only other position in different parts of the United States, which I cannot move to those locations. So, uh, I've just decided to continue being. Uh, the full time judge here in with the municipal court number fourteen, until there is a position open uh, for the federal judgeship in in Houston, Texas. It it's administrative uh, law judge in Houston, Texas. Um, uh, how are your children right now? Well, my children, um, thanks God, the um, uh, my. Uh, the baby, the premature baby, um, is. Good. How are your children now? Well, thanks God, uh, they are doing fairly well. Um, one, the uh, the baby, the premature baby, he is now the uh, director of Alex Partners uh, International Business Company. My uh, other son, a graduate from Rice and Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and now he's a physician. The third one uh, is in computer, and he's, he has a master degree in, um, from Harvard University uh, in computer. Uh, Judge, you had a dream to become a business owner, and you become a business owner. You have a dream to be a lawyer and you be a judge. Do you now have any dream for yourself, your family, and your other community? Well, again, um, I'm very blessed and I thank God for uh, allowing me to fulfill my dream. Um, well, for, for my family, I think that uh, we're very blessed. Um, and I'm, my dream for um, our community is I, um, well, I hope, but I think that we can attain that, uh, that we have a very strong um, Vietnamese American community in the United States and in anywhere in the world. Um, we, um, we contributed to this um, society. Um, we um, help one another um, to be a united uh, community. Uh, I also uh, hope, but I think that we can uh, attain too, that uh, the second generations, our children, our grandchildren, will do much, much better than the first generations. Uh, our generation, when uh, we came here as refugees, when we were um, older and we had to reestablish every, everything. So with the second generations, with um, the, um, the, the challenge that we had to go through with the first generations, our second generation, third generation of the Vietnamese American will do very, very well in this country. Uh, Jet, now, what do you consider yourself as? Are you a Vietnamese? Are you Vietnamese American or are you an American? I um, consider myself as a Vietnamese American. Um, I will never forget that um, I'm a Vietnamese. Uh, I spent 20 some years in Vietnam. Um, I came here and this country um, has given me the opportunity. Um, so I consider myself as an American. So. I am a, a Vietnamese uh, American.
Thank you chị. I love the last one. <laughs> the song O. Oh. Còn phải cái vụ ấy nữa. Mình describe cái job của chị. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Ok, mưu rồi đó. Có, 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 có. Still ok. Yeah, okay. okay chị. One, two, three, go. Yeah. Uh, just the, what kind of cases you hear in your courtroom? Okay. In my courtrooms, I um, hear basically three types of cases. The first Case, first type uh, of cases are those we call environmental cases. Those are the uh, violations uh, against the uh, the fire code, health uh, safety codes, um, constructions, electrical, mechanical codes, uh, and also the cases uh, regulating uh, permits in businesses. For example business owners of, um, let's say, restaurant, groceries, or dry cleaning businesses, or apartment complex could um, um, come to my court because the violations um, of um, health, uh, not, not clean, uh, sanitations uh, in the restaurants or groceries, um, or like uh, people with uh, dry cleaning or washetary businesses, they um, they may have to have the uh, uh, the certificate of occupancy. They also have to follow the law in um, uh, taking care of their grease trap or lean trap. Um, the people who um, want to open the business needs to have some kind of permit, uh, some kind of license. The people who handle food have to have uh, the manager uh, certification to make sure that they know how to handle the food. The um, second type of uh, violations that I handle would be traffic violations like uh, running red lines, um, the uh, speeding, uh, the traffic violations that um, can cause accidents. Um, the uh, third type of uh, violations that uh, I hear in the courtrooms here like misdemeanor theft, um, assault, uh, public intoxication, the um, uh, for uh, for for juvenile um, violations like uh, violations of curfew or um, uh, drinking under age or smoking under age. So those are the three basic type of uh, violations our courtroom handle. Thank you very much, yes. yes. Thank you. Well, um, I am in uh, the courtroom, so I see people with uh, different ethnic groups. Um, many of the defendants come to my courtrooms um, as Spanish-speaking people. So in order to speed up the process, um, I, if they tell me that they do not speak English, or if I'm, or if they ask me in Spanish, I will confirm if they speak English or Spanish, and I will ask them uh, the questions in in Spanish. And this is uh, uh, a question I regularly, uh, often ask them if they do not speak uh, English well. Um, so if um, a person's come in front of me during the arraignment time, which they can only enter the plea of either not guilty or guilty. Um, let's say that uh, a person's coming in and um, the person, he or she, does not seem to understand what I'm asking. Uh, my question is usually, um, well, ma'am or sir, uh, today you are in the ar arraignment docket. You can only enter the plea of guilty or not guilty. So if they don't understand me, I would ask them this. Um, señorita or señor? Hable español or English? And if they tell me español, por favor. And then I will ask them, uh, señor, se le acusa de um, manejando su vehículo uh, auto de velocidad or um, pase una luz rojas. That means that uh, I'm asking, I'm telling them they are, um, they operate a vehicle running the red light or um, um, past the speed limit. So I tell them what they were charged with. Um, 
or, or if they um, they were charged with no insurance or no driver license, I would say, Senor, um, se le acusa de money handled to vehículo sin licencia, sin aseguranza, como se declara culpable o inocente. Uh, so I asked them, how would you like to plead? Not guilty or guilty for driving without driver license or insurance. And if they can say, um, no culpable, they would say, no, I'm not guilty. Then I will ask them, quiere un juicio con juez, con una persona, o con jurado, con seis personas. Um, I'm asking them, what would you like to request a trial by judge, with one person a judge, or with uh, six uh, people, jury trial? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I was the eldest in a family of seven children. My parents were originally from Hanoi, north of Vietnam. They were fearful of living under the communist regime. They fled Hanoi and became refugees in Saigon, south of Vietnam. In an effort to try to rebuild their life in the new land, Saigon, they rented a tiny space and make it into our home and our business and, and their business. Until this day, I can still remember the address was 20 Ding Tien Huang, Da Cao. The space was very small for a family of later on nine, ten people. And during the day, they turned the front room into the classroom with long table and benches. At night time, the table were convenient, conveniently put together and became our bed at night. When I was eight years old, my mother gave birth to her youngest child, the seventh child. And I became the little babysitter and housekeeper for the young sister because after that, she started working with full time outside of the house with the Department of Social Services. When I was 14, my parents closed the teaching business and opened the store selling embroidery clothes and fabrics. And I became the teenage sales girl for this shop, which later became a well-known store selling embroidery clothes and fabrics called Huang Mai Embroidery Store. Even though we lived very frugally and we were poor, my parents were very generous in when it comes to our education, they made sure that we all had college degree. The war impacted my life tremendously. We often had to deal with curfews, um, uprisings, rockets, and between in the year between 1966 to probably 1969 and especially during 1968 new year or often called dates offensive we had to deal with daily launchings of rockets by the communists into saigon in fact our relatives lost their two children 
in an, a rocket attack one night in an effort to protect us my father dug a big hole in the middle of the kitchen covered it with a concrete top and made it into a bunker like shelter at night time at the first sound of the rocket hitting Saigon he would wake us up order us to go down to the bunker cover the concrete top and stay there until the last rounds of rocket launching in March of 1975 the communist took over a few cities in South Vietnam. My parents were terrified knowing that the communist probably will get to Saigon. They had experience living under the communist regime and had to flee Hanoi to become refugees in Saigon, South Vietnam. And they knew for sure that if the communists took over Saigon, they would surely persecute our family for a crime of running away from them 20 years prior in 1954. My parents were terrified knowing that they would persecute our family so by all means, we had to escape to find a way to get out of Vietnam. In the evening of April 29, 1975, just a few hours before the communists took over Saigon, my husband and I carry our two sons. One was a month old premature baby and the other one was an 18 month old toddler began our journey of escape leaving everything behind except some clothes and as many cans of baby powder formula that we could carry, we left our home following a lead that there might be some boats at the dock leaving Vietnam. In search of finding a way out of the war-torn city, somehow I got separated from my husband I found myself stranded on an unfamiliar streets, surrounded with gun files, explosions, and chaos as people ran, fought, and looted. Only through providence that my husband found me and the two babies. Just in time, people were permitted to get on board of the boat. Until this day, I still could not understand how my husband found me and the two babies in that chaotic situation. Until this day, I can still remember the terror of climbing on a narrow two-story height ladder, trying to reach on board of the ship. Carrying the backpack, I held my baby tightly 
trying to fight the terrifying thoughts of tripping, falling, and worse, dropping the baby into the dark sea water beneath us for nearly two weeks our boat sailed toward uncertainty with little food or water malnourished my body stopped producing milk unfortunately there was no clean water to mix with the baby formula in an effort to purify the water, we found an old electrical coil and used it to boil the water. The coil was so rusty that most of the boiling water came out with rust. We had to allow the rust to settle to the bottom and use the less rusty water on top to mix with the baby formula to feed the baby. Once we got to the open sea, our flag of South Vietnam was lowered down and then removed from the pole. We all cried. Now, we had no destination, no home, and no country. After a few days, our boat became totally inoperable. Thankfully, the American Navy 7 Fleet came to our rescue. They provided us with food, water, and then pulled our boat to a Navy base in the Philippines. All of the people in our boat were transferred to the Seven Fleet and were taken to Guam. After months of staying at various refugee camps in Guam and in Arkansas. We were sponsored to Chicago, Illinois. My name is Kathy Han Huan. My maiden name is Phạm Bảo Khanh. In court, I am Judge Kathy Han. I am the full-time presiding judge for Houston Municipal Court Number 14. Mayor Lee Brown appointed me in 1998 and I was continuously reappointed by Mayor Bill White and then by our current mayor, Mayor Anise Parker, for a total of 15 years. In 1998, Mayor Lee Brown explained the reason why he chose me as a presiding judge for Court 14. I preside over Court 14 full-time, five days a week. My court has eight sessions called dockets a day. I hear criminal cases and also environmental cases such as those violations against public safety, health, and sanitation codes. In addition to hearing cases, I also serve as a magistrate for the state of Texas. I give statutory warnings to people who are arrested. I issue arrest and such warrants and issue emergency protective orders for victims of family violence. When I first started 15 years ago, the number of women 
lawyers and judges, and especially Asian, was much smaller than now. I was the first Vietnamese woman appointed a full-time presiding judge in Houston, Texas, and probably in the United States. During my first year, I felt that I encountered not only double, but triple challenges. I am a woman, and I belong to a small minority group that people had little knowledge about. Every day, I dealt with a large group of defendants, police officers, and lawyers who came from various different ethnic groups. The challenges came not only from the majority, but also from other ethnic groups as well. However, I have overcome all the challenges by showing people that I am fair, competent, and hardworking. I follow the law, but I treat people not only with respect, but also with compassion. I have always kept in contact with the Vietnamese American community, even before I became a lawyer and a judge. During the 90s, I, together with a number of friends in Houston, organized cultural events to raise funds for the refugees and orphanage in Hong Kong, and also to establish scholarship for Asian students at Rice University, South Texas College of Law, and Texas Southern University. During the last 10 years, I have hosted a number of radio and television programs to keep the Vietnamese community informed. Like Houston Mayor Lee Brown had said, Kathy Han is the leading advocate for the well-being of the Vietnamese community. She has fought hard to promote and enhance understanding between the Vietnamese American and other communities. I consider myself Vietnamese American. I was born in Vietnam. It's important for us to teach our children the Vietnamese language and to encourage them to maintain our heritage and culture. But I also felt indebted to the United States, which has given us not only a home to live, but also ample opportunities for us to rebuild our life in this new land, which we now called our dear country. When my two sons were seniors in high school, I decided that it was time for me to seek my dream to become a lawyer. I was accepted to South Texas College of Law in Houston. I went to school on a part-time basis while continue working to support my family and to pay for college tuition. I was very worried of not being able to make it through law school, realizing that I had many disadvantages. I was one of the oldest students in law school. Besides schools, I had to concentrate on my job and my family, and English was not my first language. In order to deal with my situation, I recorded the lectures and studied them while I was commuting to work and to school. I com 
successfully completed law school and passed the bar exam the first time around. My first feeling when we arrived in Chicago was a deep sense of joy and gratitude. However, we were very worried about finding jobs to support our family. Two months after we arrived in Chicago, my husband started working in a factory. Unfortunately, he was injured in an accident involving the punch press. He lost half of his last joint of the three middle fingers. Because of his accident, I had to go out working part-time cleaning houses to support our family. At night time, I took classes in English, typing, and other vocational classes to improve my job skill. In 1976, I found my first full-time job in America working as a typist for the governor's office in Chicago and later a secretary and a program specialist. Later on, Truman College hired me as its employment coordinator. In 1981, we moved to Houston, Texas to be with our parents and also to be entrepreneur of two businesses, a washeteria and dry cleaning business and a translation interpretation service provide different language interpreters for hospitals, lawyers, courts. Thanks to this job, I found the job in the lawyer's office to be a paralegal and later on a lawyer and then a judge. <laughs>